and welcome to GM Tips, the show where my friends and I share with you our thoughts and suggestions on how to game master your role-playing game. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master on Fury's Reach. Some of you want to play your typical fantasy game, running through dungeons and gathering items to take back to sell for gold. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's actually pretty fun. Sometimes you want to dive deeper into your role-playing experience, want to be surrounded by it, to breathe it in as if the story were a decadent incense. We want the game to excite us, scare us, make us feel something more. Today we discuss creating mood, and with our special guest, Ivan Van Norman, suspense. Let's dissect this by looking at fear-inducing themes. People enjoy these because they make them feel intensely. Suspense, anticipation, giving the player enough time and specific, limited, curated information to fill in the blanks with their own fears and imagination. Deep fear isn't created by showing you a scary monster. It's in knowing there's a monster nearby, but wondering what the monster could possibly be. Watching a monster eat a dead body versus watching pieces of bone pick clean get thrown into a large, wet pile of bones one at a time from around a corner as you hear the gnawing and snarling of a monster. Knowing it's one creature versus, in my imagination, it's the possibility of monsters that could be big enough to tear me apart. It's the possibility of any monster that could make that specific noise. Allow the players to sit on that fear and anticipation, so when the monster actually comes along, they have a built-in fear making it much more frightening than it actually is. The players react to both the monster and their fear of it. Mood setting. Let's use a room to describe mood setting. In this room, we have four walls of equal length, one door made of wood with a brass handle, a dresser with photos and a jewelry box on top, a four-poster bed with pillows and a blanket, a closet with two sliding mirrored doors, two side tables with lamps. If drawn on a map, it would look like outlines of a simple bedroom. The players would know generally how they would navigate the room. If I wanted to fill the players with anxiety, I'd describe the room. You walk through a brightly lit hallway, at the end of which is a lacquered wooden door partially open. The sound of television blasts through the opening. As you walk in, you cover your ears as the black and white men on this old TV engage in battle from across the room. Their screams and gunshots bombard your senses. The drawers of the dresser are open, and clothes hang and scatter about the floor and disheveled bed. Picture frames with images obscured by broken glass sit strategically on the dresser. A jewelry box overturned reveals a twisting ballerina. Walking through the room, there's an electricity in the air, and the carpet feels like walking on crumpled paper. If I wanted to fill the players with dread, I'd say. You walk through a hallway, the only light emanating dimly from under a door to the room at the end. The quiet in the house envelops you. You open the old wooden door, its brass handle is wet, and the door creaks open with a loud And you notice the light from the room is coming from an old TV half revealed from within the closet. Static and nothing else. Shadows pour over most of the room. The dust thick in the air covers the dresser and the bed. Walking through the room, you smell the heavy musk of fresh blood. Suddenly, BAM! The door slams shut and the shadows rustle across the walls, over the bed, then down to the floor. And you get the feeling that something is stalking you from under the bed. And if I wanted to fill the players with mystery, I'd describe the room. The hallway's warm candlelit sconces lead you to an elaborately carved wooden door. Its antique handle gives easily, and you're flooded with the sweet smell of cinnamon and apples and something else. As you gaze into the massive chamber, the carvings on the grand oak four-poster bed dance in the light of the lamps on the nightstands. The frames on the photos of the dresser stand out from the dark burgundy walls, but the item that catches your attention is the long ivory and jade jewelry box that sits further down the dresser, its gold lock unlatched. In each of these three descriptions, you're filled with different emotions based on what you imagine from what I described. GM skills, reading people and listening. In order to navigate player emotions, it'll be good to exercise your reading people and listening skills. Players will tell you what they're afraid of or what they're interested in by their body language and how or what they say next. Role playing, as they say, isn't acting, it's reacting. The Game Master provides the environment and NPCs, the players react to what's given to them, the Game Master reacts to their reactions, and so on. It's playing! Like kids, be honest about your reactions. Relinquish yourself to the agreed upon story and play in the most honest way. Listen to one another and make your choice about what to do next based on what your party does. This is role playing. This is game mastering. 
Reading people and listening gives you the ingredients to hit those perfect time moments to evoke the emotion you want in your players. And sometimes those moments live in the silence. Today we discuss creating mood and with our special guest, Ivan Van Norman, suspense. I could roll on, but instead, let's discuss this with the creator of Sagas of Sundry, Dread, Outbreak Undead, the ABCs of RPGs, and the king of suspense, Ivan Van Norman. Ah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having me back. It's good that you're back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. We're it's, so it's, silly. It's, 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 it's back at the table talking about GM tips, and yeah. uh, we get to talk about after a big thing like Dread happening. We can actually go what into it. What a beautiful experience. Thank you so much for oh sharing God. that. We were literally just uh, silly talking even beforehand. It's like you have all the best qualities that you bring into a player. It was joyful. It was honest. It was intense. So many tears. You did all the things that you want in every player that you have at a game. Well, so don't even don't You. Even worry. Well, so. Let's talk about you for a little bit. Okay. Let me tell you how great you are. Okay. As a game master, sure. you are... <laughs> Hope you don't mind if I don't make eye contact because it's going to be hard. No, okay. Tell me. What's up? You have this way of, I mean, you already have this deep masculine voice, right? But because you like to play games that are very true and honest to you, mm -hmm. like, man, you really utilize the scary in you. <laughs> it got a, that a little intense sometimes. And yeah. it was fun because you don't get to, just like a player, you don't often always get the opportunity to like stretch your boundaries mm -hmm. and go outside of your comfort zone in order to get something that's really impactful. But we were all in such a, like a heated mix of like um, uh, creating cool moments that it was really, it was, it was good to be yeah. able to come out and just be, like, especially in the last episode, just like having that intensity just come out on that oh, certain man. level and have it feel like, have it translate into what you guys were dealing with at the time. It was, it was terrifying and satisfying even in my own skin. Oh, you couldn't <laughs> tell. Nobody could tell. We were so involved and you, your voice was, because of where you were sitting, and mm. it was very strategic, the way you laid everybody right. out, and and the lighting, mm. and the sound of your voice came from That's like important. the back of our heads, and the way when we pulled uh, from the tower, you would hover around us, it's... and the pacing of your voice was very interesting. Yeah. And it was a, it was usually you don't get a chance to do that at a traditional table to like get up and have that like. That that thing that wants to talk to you it was essentially the demon and the angel mm -hmm. that was supposed to be talking to you, but instead it's the dungeon master telling you what you need to be dealing with right now. That's so, so scary. You're so it's scary. It's a book. It's a good <laughs> bit. And that, but that, but that, like that begins all the way character creation too. You yeah, know? and you were very so. good about nurturing us. You're like, okay, this isn't a normal game, guys. Right. Let's talk about We put things. a lot of disclaimers on this show. There was a lot of disclaimers on Dread that we expressedly, I felt it was important for me to tell everyone. I said, I said, we're gonna do some bad things. You don't have to do any of the challenges. You can choose not to do any of the challenges at any time if you're uncomfortable, but I'm going in, I think literally the words was, is that I want you to make all the hard choices mm -hmm. and I'm, my job is to hurt you. Essentially, yeah. like I, what I want is, is I want you to feel so good about the character that you created that when we break that shell with true and honest fear, if I'm doing my job right and I'm breaking that shell, then there's still the gooey center that's inside is your character and not Satine. Another know? disclaimer, though, yeah. is that we are good friends. Yes, and everybody that was there are good friends. So we yes. all had a. A uh, base trust. Base trust, which is important because it's actually it's easier to have an argument in character with someone if you already have that base trust yeah. in place. Um, you get two strangers, even really strong actors. You kind of have to like because there's that millisecond where people can question: Is this something that is okay for me to do right now? Yeah, that can sometimes mean the difference between like a good performance and a phenomenal performance mm -hmm. you know so. yeah that was really interesting because I innately felt like I had to apologize ahead of time so when we right. all walked into the green room I was like I just want to tell you all I'm really sorry mm -hmm. because I'm going to say things right. and you need to know that Satine Ooh. is not saying this right the character sat is saying this mm -hmm. but because we all 
had those things to say right. to one another, right. we all were like, I'm going to say things too. We did it too. I, I, <laughs> and I felt very kindred to you in that because I did the same thing even when we sat down and was ready to begin. It's like, I'm, I apologize in advance for any anxiety, stress, fear, and issues I may bring up in this game, but I'm going to do it. It's yeah. going to happen. And, and just know that this is still a safe place. And if you don't want to do some of these things or if it's too much, you just yell cut and just tell me. But it never got there because we were all really comfortable. So that is actually kind of a build up to the suspense, right? Mm -hmm. So you are instilling this idea mm -hmm. into the player's heads before you even start playing the game. Right. You say, it's a scary game. Okay, it's a scary game. But this is your background. Yeah. And I want you to push, mm -hmm. and I want you to go deep into deep. your emotions in your head. Right. And so before we even get there, we're frightened. Right, and that's a good point. <laughs> and, that, and that can begin literally a character creation. Yeah. And we're, we're, when we did the questionnaires, remember we did the first round of questionnaires with um, the just the ITTD game, and that was all very standard dread, like let's create some good character arcs in which to create some moments and intensity out of. But then the second one and the second follow-up meeting that I did with you guys was about, okay, now how can we take this interesting little character sat that you make and how can we make her fucked up? Yeah, okay, like, a, a year's a long time. Yes. Like a lot can happen. A lot can a happen. A lot did happen. And it was literally about that transition of like, okay, you have a really interesting character set and this is something that we're working on but what's really going on? Uh, like, and to be able to go into there and say that and make and make whoever you're playing with ask that question. I'm sorry, uh, have the game master ask that question and have that player answer it in a way that they're like, oh, okay, well, well oh, 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 I guess there is something going on. I had no idea that I would make her, that that character was going, oh, I guess I shouldn't say all the details, but you know, there were things. No, I think it's fair to say some of the details. I mean. I, well, she lived, you know, she got kicked out of she her got house. Kicked out of her home. Was, she had a drug problem. Yeah. She lived basically in uh, a tent under a bridge. Yeah. Like, and those were all things we discovered in character creation. Yeah. And they were things that you were like, well, maybe she's had some trouble at home. Like, is she having problems at home or is she like, did she get kicked out of her house? And why did she get kicked and out of her house? And why did she get kicked out of her house? And you came up with all of the good stuff and it was just me basically saying, um, said that's good, but how can we how can we make the hard choice? These are good choices, but how can we make the hard choice? Yeah. And you made all the hard choices. You did and then you brought them to the table with you and it was great. Yeah, <laughs> so in game. Suspense, mm -hmm. anticipation, yes, <laughs> drama, yeah. timing. Um, we talk a bit um, about suspense and how what you say is scary, right? But it's not always in what you say. Sometimes it's about the silence. Mm. As a game master, how do you navigate that? So suspense is sometimes about painting a picture of what's not there versus what is there. Because it's really easy to describe a monster, but can you describe a monster without describing the monster? Can you paint the picture of how it sounds, how it looks, how it's walking, where is it coming from, what's it showing? These are the things that build suspense, not necessarily like the gruesome mob. Like those are great for the initial reveals and like the, 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 the like, when you want to get that in adrenaline dump right there, that's fine for that. But when you want to build suspense, you want to you want to create negative space in the scenario instead of just painting the details in the line. Like the first Alien was always my favorite. Yes. Like throwback into that because that was in a lot of those shots. It was just a mask with a trash bag, <laughs> you know. But because of the use of shadow and the use of light and the way that it it's there and it's not, and just the fact that that 90% of that monster for like the air duct scene is just a blip. It's just a sound bite. And that's what's scary, not seeing this thing like crawling through a hole coming at you. Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, the thing is my favorite. Right. Where you have this entire movie of what it does and right. and it the way people are reacting to it. But you never see it, you never yeah. know what it is. And it's good because, you know, we are, when you are essentially give people permission to not trust each other, <laughs> they will then not trust each other. Yes. And what that movie did is it gave every, 
character in that story permission to not trust each other. And that was the other part too about when, and sorry to hop back to character creation real quick, but we, I think one of the first things we said too when we were putting things together is like, I am giving you permission to make the hard choices. This is not one of those shows where I want you to, to play light. Because you know. we, like the naturally, mm -hmm. you don't want to offend your fellow player. Right. You want, mm -hmm. you, we all know that playing games with each other, we want to right. help each other out, we want to make each other feel good. Right. But you need that permission to. You need that permission cross because because <laughs> if you don't get that permission, then you're just an asshole. You mm -hmm. know that's making people uncomfortable. Yeah. But if everybody knows what they're getting into and it's consensual and everyone's permissions are asked and everyone knows what they're getting into, you can make some really magnificent stuff. So, um, yeah, it's uh, and then beyond just drama and timing, like you learn at some point when you have watched either enough movies or you've seen the reaction from people. It's back to when we first were talking all those ages ago is when the first episode of GM Tips about listening yeah. to your players. Drama and suspense is still about listening and body language. And there's a moment in Dread in which I wasn't planning on going up and touching um, Darby at all. Like that was not a plan at all. But looking at her, I could see that she was very much at ease. And, and in, in horror, it is often about the the calm before the storm, right? Yeah. And so she was clearly in a calm space and time and stuff. And I actually had to ask myself as I was getting up and moving to her, it's like, is this too much right now? Is like what I'm going to do to her right now, is this, is this me being aggressively insane or is this gonna make a good moment? And I had to give myself permission to be like, this is what you want to do. You can see how relaxed she is right now. Let's do something about that. Yeah. Let's make this happen. And she jumped out of her skin and we all saw it. You can see it on film. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like Dread is an extreme example. It's an extreme example, sure. Yeah. So how do for players who are just making uh, tabletop games, they want right. to add suspense to their games. How, like, what can they do without having to get up and move around? Right. Um the big thing is is that use like you can use props and small things to help build suspense like mood and lighting and tension, but I think it is just about going to your players and saying, I really would like to make a dark game and I'd like you to play this dark game with me and I'd like to make some interesting choices with you that I think would be fun. And then, because once everybody's committed into it, then as the dungeon master, you just start looking at how the breadcrumbs are placed. And it, it's literally as simple as, is this player really into this story hook because you know they have an inner demon? Like, okay, this character has an inner demon, and how do we milk that so that it works with the other players? Or this character is really afraid of the dark. Okay, well, how can we make them feel safe and a light and hopeful, and then out of nowhere drop them into darkness? Like, how can you? You have to be a little malicious when you play in suspense and terrible because your your job <laughs> is to take people's fears yeah. and exploit them. But in, like, say, a D and D game, you can add those elements right. in and out of scenes. Right. So I guess it's more about saying, I would like to do this once in a while. I really right. want to push you sometimes, and I'll lift you back. Yeah. But you know, this is the kind of breathe. game we're gonna play. Let's breathe, because yeah. it is all about you know, you gotta pull back so everyone can take a breath. Otherwise, it's just all uh, adrenaline anxiety. all the time. Yeah, and it's difficult. Yeah. So, um, in a standard game, when you're just kind of having fun with your friends, if you want to add some suspense and tension first uh, to it, first of all, get permission <laughs> uh, from your group. Um, give yourself permission to do it, and then find something unique in your characters that you can go and build suspense around. Or if you don't really want to have it be character focused and you just want to get a monster or something that's terrifying inside of it, learn how you can create that negative space of whatever that creature is. If it's a ghoul, how do you show what the ghoul's done before you get to the ghoul? If it's something like um, an undead Draco Lich, it's like what does his reign of destruction and what does, what are these details that showcase how malicious and terrifying and terrible and gory this lich is before you even get to them? Because they'll be so much more scared of your monster if you show them just what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. Instead of showing them what they're capable of when they get there, because then they have to react to the most extreme while they're in the moment. So that's a Does good that segue to creep versus threat. Right. Oh yes, creep versus threat. So when I was putting all this together, and even in some of my older uh, horror games, like with Outbreak and stuff, you sometimes have to balance this idea of creep versus threat. Creep is, 
what is the visceral terrible things that people fear and how do you get that reaction out of them with this versus the threat which is actually something that's physically harming their life like an like a cultist would be high threat because they're usually out to kill you or do things or move things together you know while the like the 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 pool of blood and the sacrificial altar that they've put together is high creep, but it doesn't pose a lot of threat to the yeah. players. So you have to balance it. You have to give them a little bit of creep, and then you have to give them a little bit of threat. Because if it's just creep the whole time, then you're kind of a boring, uneventful yeah. campaign. Yeah. But if you're just doing threat, then it's not scary of an action film. Yeah. You know what I mean? So where do you get it? And in the case of Dread, it was very clear in my mind what was high creep and what was high threat and what was kind of middle creep and middle threat without getting into spoilers too yeah. much. Well, in that, it was interesting because we had already played a session. Right. And so we brought our own level of fear into the second session. Right. So. And you had expectations, which thankfully I broke. Yeah. You know. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And that's fun as a player. <laughs> um, so let's go into that. Honesty. <sighs> it would not. The experience that I had playing with you and Matt and everybody else, if we keep using Dread as an analog, would not have been the experience that it was if you guys weren't 100% totally honest. 100%. <laughs> in what you were doing and how you were doing it. So, I mean, this is more of a question for you. Like, what did you feel like brought honesty into, into oh. what you were doing? Well, you know? no cell phones. Yeah. I mean, there were cameras everywhere. I mean, how, there was a, there was more cameras than I've ever experienced on a set. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the way we were sitting and engaged with one another, uh, the surrounding really helped. The mm -hmm. lighting helped. But we were ready to play, and mm -hmm. we were so we knew our characters very well. We knew what we were capable of. Right. We were excited to bring in our backstory, and we had all all of us wanted had a timing thing where we wanted to plant certain seeds throughout right. and then you hovering and it was just you created this world for mm -hmm. us to exist in and we just wanted to be a part of it so bad and you committed to it when you got in there you didn't look back which is that's that old adage of like no distractions at the table right yeah so you you were so invested into what was going on there was a so. part that didn't make it in hmm. i think it was like episode four and you guys, in episode four, you guys cut sound mm. in the edit, which was genius. Um, but I think I screamed louder than I've ever screamed before. <laughs> I was like, it was like one of those guttural cry screams, yeah. and I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth. Oh. But it was because. I remember that now. Yeah, I'm like, oh, sorry if I broke the mic. But it was really interesting because it was. We knew we were playing a game, mm -hmm. but we were so invested that I could see everything. I could see the creatures coming at us. I could yeah. see that little pinhole light. Everything was intense. We were afraid. I think I was holding a little toy. It was the most charming, <laughs> adorable thing I've ever seen to see. And that's the thing about honesty, too. It's like silly moments like that where you're holding a plastic toy axe that your character even knows is a plastic She's like toy axe. holding it as if it was but actually going to. But it's the only thing you had, and you found it as an anchor. And I saw that honesty there. I'm like, yeah, she's she knows that's useless. But it's making her feel better right now. So yeah. That's, that's good. So, that's yeah, good. it's the honesty, but it's being able to be honest with everybody. And yeah. not only in myself, mm -hmm. every single person was honest. Nobody was distracted. Right. We were patiently waiting to hear what everyone else yeah. was saying. And the quiet, and you're quiet. It was all encompassing. So the suspense isn't just something that you do, is what I'm you feeling. You create it too, absolutely. It's the entire group. Yeah, everyone And if was... somebody breaks it, everybody steps out. Right, and it's good. You were definitely carrying the torch, and if it was a marathon, you're right. No one ever stopped to breathe. No one ever put the torch down at any time. Mm -mm. You all just kept running and rolling with it, which was great. Um, and it made me think about how, like, in a lot of, even in acting, because we were role-playing, and we were improving, and we were all acting at the same time. But it really made me think about how you guys were just reacting and listening to each other. Like you, role playing for you was not just acting, flowing the drama, and telling the story about my magnificent character. You were just reacting. I'm a terrible actor, so I <laughs> but I love role playing games. <laughs> yeah. 
and a lot of your <laughs> acting was listening to, and everyone else was too they were just listening to the tables and instead of thinking that 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 kind of that that kind of hole you can get to and as an actor like what's my next line what's my next line what's my next line like be ready with the performance of my next line yeah. instead you were listening and you in your brain were like okay no no that's not how it is or it's like or you you bursted out with what your character was actually thinking because you were actually thinking like that person. Exactly. You know, and it didn't matter what lines you had. And in a weird way, that's what the great part about role playing is, is because it removes scripted content out the door and yeah. it says, Satine, she is yelling at you right now. What are you going to do about it? Oh, you know, hell no. <laughs> right. And that's just what it comes down to. And yeah. that's how you create some honesty yeah. in a game. So. Wow, that, this is really. <laughs> I love talking to you. Um, I'm talking to you too. So I'm going to jump into the last three questions. Okay. But you've already answered them, so I'm going to shift them a little bit. All right. Have your pregame house rules changed a bit since Dread? I haven't had a lot of pre, had a lot of house games since the last time we talked, and Dread because we've been having <laughs> so many things so happening. So much Dread. But I would say definitely more. There's a lot more pregame in the sense of expectations. Mm -hmm. Like, I always talked about, I think even in the last time we chatted, I talked about managing the expectations of your players, but now that feels even more important to me than it's ever been, because if we're gonna do really intense things, I want them to know, or if literally the expectation is, because a lot of circumstances like a house game, I wouldn't want to be intense. I just want to do a dungeon crawler with my friends. Yeah. So I might be like, guys, I know that you're, we're like, you know, King of Suspense and blah 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 and all this stuff. But can we play. can we just like kill a dragon today? <laughs> can we just do that? Can I can I literally just roll up a really, really meta ranger and just shoot some arrows? Because that <laughs> yeah. sounds really fun right now, you know? Yeah. And being able to be okay with saying that and 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 no worries. So, you cool. know. A new favorite GM moment? <laughs> I think it has to be either between, I think one of them either has to be between Darby's legit scream and clasping her and feeling her, feeling her body like crush into a tiny ball. It was the one true <laughs> moment in which like I saw someone and I saw, and I was like, wow, I really scared them. Like, I, I mean, I was trying to create a cool moment and all this, but it's like, no, I really, like, that was a lot for them. She needed many hugs afterwards. She needed many <laughs> hugs afterwards. And I, and I actually, after, I actually kind of vaguely remember after that being, no, I don't think so. I don't think there was any care after that because we were still so in the moment. But I remember in my brain being like, Oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like well, I'm doing this to you right now, but I'm so sorry. You know, between either of that, it. she fucking loved it. It was the best. That's also the part of it too. If you have, if, as a GM, if you're malicious, you have to have some sadistic players as well, or uh, vice versa. If the GM's a little sadistic, you have to have some malicious players as yeah. well too. They're um, masochistic. masochistic yes. yes, all the words that start with M. <laughs> um, and the second one that was really sincere was is talking and narrating and telling you um, during episode four and having everything kind of happen and then lo looking around the table, looking at everyone's reactions and getting into it and then looking at you and you're already looking at me, but it's just like mascara everywhere. And I'm like, oh, 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 <laughs> okay. You're like watching me cry. No, it was, it was one of those where it was honest. like, it was honest and I had, like I felt your sadness for a moment, and it was, I used that. And it was like, oh my God, that's really, really, really sad right now. Let's use that <laughs> against everybody else in the table at the moment, and you know? You <laughs> so it felt a little bit like uh, sadness Tai Chi. Yeah, just like energy spread, tai Chi. spread the sadness around the table a little bit. <laughs> Um, God, it makes me seem so, such like I just an want, asshole. I just want to talk about Dread for like five uh, hours. Okay. I, I know. New yeah. GM tip. Okay. <laughs> New this GM tip. This is the tip. last question. Okay. New GM tip. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking to create suspense or even horror tension even in your games, the first person you need to give yourself permission to do something crazy to is yourself. Like, 
look inside of whoever you are as a GM and be like, okay, these are the things that I have done and these are the things that I'm most proud of. How can I take it one step further? What can I do to commit one step more than where I've been at previously? And I would say, look at the one moment that you're the most proud of in a game that you've played. How did that make you feel? And then ask yourself, okay, what's the next step? Like if you made a really grand moment because all of your players are like they got the artifact they were looking for and they're celebrating and all the crowds cheering around them, how do you scale that up even more to make them feel like they've saved the world, that they've saved the universe, that they saved this entire dimension, you know? And then how do you take those little things that they celebrated and just crank it up to 11? Um, likewise in fear, how do you take something that felt really good and then just commit to it? Because I will say that that one game, I just broke all my own boundaries before I even broke yours. That's it's like true. I had to give myself permission to go hard or go home. So with that, to end this whole <laughs> bit of suspense, fear, all, all the setting the mood and tone, um, I'm gonna go back to your original GM tip was uh, aftercare. Because oh. this is very important and people don't talk about this a lot. It's when you true. push people's boundaries, you have to spend time with them afterwards. Mm -hmm. Four hour, two hour, six hour, eight hour game, over multiple sessions, just make sure you spend time with your players, it's talk with them. Important. They need like a half hour, 15 minutes, an hour, just give them attention and mm -hmm. time to pull them out because not a lot of people are can do the things that we did in Dread. Right. It's very, very intense it's on not the always, emotions. It's not, and especially if people have a lot that they're going on with at that time too, if you're hitting buttons, you're gonna hit buttons and you're right, absolutely. So you have to create a safe space. So you have that's, to create a safe space. Yeah. Go talk to your players <laughs> and go and give them hugs. Tell them that you still love them. Tell them that they're great people and that they're making amazing moments with you. Like, be a good person through and throughout. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nah. I mean, we. To draw a little bit of comparison to this, when we were done with the game, we basically all just like had a group hug and we and we laid it all out what was happening, and then we were able to take that collective <sighs> and kind of put it away. Yeah, I mean, it took like twelve hours of writing each other, telling us how each other how much we love each other, <laughs> right, and shaking yeah. down group texts and you know yeah. and. Uh, and people, other people driving them home. That was another part too. It's like sometimes after a big session like that, you need someone else to drive you home. Yeah. <laughs> so these are all very important things. Yeah. You have just witnessed a whole lot of Ivan amazingness. That's our show. Before we go, Ivan, please share with everyone where we can find you on the internet. So uh, I'm on all the internets uh, under Hydra underscore Lord, Instagram, Facebook, all the fun stuff. Twitters. Uh, you can see me uh, on Sagas of Sundry Dread, which you can check it out on projectalpha.com at the moment, and every Friday playing board games here on Geek and Sundry uh, from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. As well as Wednesday nights at twitch.tv slash dnd with Maze Arcana doing Fury's Reach, in which I play uh, <laughs> Johan um, Wahilder. Wahilder, <laughs> who is a deliciously difficult dandy who happens to also be a well-received writer. Mm, funny yeah, that. Yeah, funny that. As always, I'm Satine Phoenix at Satine Phoenix. You can ask me GM tip questions at hashtag Ask Satine and find me every Sunday at noon on Maze Arcana's Orphan Echo on twitch.tv slash Maze Arcana and every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Dungeon Mastering on twitch.tv slash dnd. And if you haven't seen it already, <laughs> check out Sagas of Sundry Dread on projectalpha.com. Thank you for watching us here on Geek and & Sundry, and see you next time. Ivan. Uh, yes. Would you please GM us out of here? <sighs> As you stand on a lonely road, snow falls around you, feet deep, as each one of the crunching bits of sound echoes in the silence that is only wind and dust around you. You can feel the skin pressing against your ribs as hunger 
constantly pains you as you look from window to window of each desolate house looking for a small piece of shelter. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, a small bit of orange gleam dances in the horizon. Is it a candlelight? Or is it something else? It's only about 50 or 60 feet away from you. Do you continue to go down the road or investigate the light?